Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and National Geographic Society Roundtable, Our Forests Under Threat, Protecting Forests for Sustainable Livelihoods. My name is Vanessa Soreo. I'm the executive producer at National Geographic Society, where our mission is to use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. And I'll be moderating today's discussion. FAO and NGS are longstanding partners. In 2014, we teamed up to raise awareness of food and agriculture issues in the National Ma Geographic magazine series, The Future of Food. This year, our organizations formed a new collaboration that uses documentary film screenings to raise awareness of food and agriculture issues. Today's event is part of that collaboration, and we'll be screening a wonderful film, A Journey Without a Map, New Generation Plantations in Uganda by James Thompson. After the screening, we're fortunate to have several experts in sustainable forestry joining us. Kathy Abuso is the president and CEO of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and she'll give us a keynote present presentation. This will be followed by remarks by Metta Wilkie, director of the Forestry Policy and Resources Division at FAO, Alex Chabawampi, Senior Corporate Social Responsibility Program Manager at the New Forest Company in Uganda, Owen Samata and Agnes Masanda of Forest High School in Uganda, and Huma Khan, Global Communications Lead for Forests at World Wildlife Fund International. Some quick housekeeping notes about the webinar. We'll be using the Zoom's chat function to share panelists' bios as they speak, and participants can also use this to post links um, or comments to share with each other. There's also a question and answer box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, please use this to submit questions for the panelists and we will compile those questions and ask them following all the panelists' remarks. And finally, this webinar is being recorded, so we will be able to share the entire recording with you at the conclusion of our event. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Vimlenda, Vimlendra Sharan, Director of the FAO Liaison for North America, who will give opening remarks and then introduce the film. Vimlendra, you're muted. I am so sorry. Is that okay now? Yes. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And on behalf of FAO North America Office and AGEO, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you joining today's webinar from various parts of the world to discuss the importance of protecting forests for sustainable livelihoods. I'm extremely grateful to Kathy Abso, President and CEO of Sustainable Forestry Initiative for agreeing to deliver the keynote address and lead the discussion today. And to all our other esteemed panelists who have found time to join us. We are most excited to have with us two very young panelists, school students, Owen and Agnes, from the Forest High School in Kampala, who will share with us their perspective on how sustainable plantation program in their city has impacted their lives. As Vanessa mentioned, FAO North America Office and Nat Geo have over the last year collaborated in bringing together events of this sort. Of course, we used to meet in person in the excellent screening facilities with Nagio, but the pandemic has forced us to adapt and I'm glad that we have done so. Where earlier we could have a maximum of 60 to 80 people joining us, but today we have more than 500 registrants from all over the world. And that clearly also indicates the level of interest in this topic. Over the centuries, the world has experienced vast forest loss, and that's known to all with the spread of agriculture and population growth. We also understand that we need to check this, but to check deforestation and reverse these trends requires a change in politics, laws, institutions, and incentives in and beyond the forestry sector. We have to adopt a landscape approach which embraces activities such as restoring degraded forest land, boosting agricultural productivity, realigning farm and forest incentives to protect forests from being converted into farmland, and involving local communities 
more directly in the design and oversight of our forest management. It is important that we help governments improve economic policy and the management of, and governance of forest sector. At FAO, the starting point is to ask how can nations reduce forest degradation and check corrupt practices in the sector so that forest provides more sustainable development and livelihood opportunities. The challenge for any policymaker around the globe is to find effective ways in which to measure the value of forest generated services and effectively feed it into the decisions that impact more than one sector and into macroeconomic and development policies. I'm sure Matej Wilki, Director of Forest Policy and Resource Division at FAO will speak at greater detail to these issues during her presentation. But a good resource also would be to refer to FAO's flagship report, The State of World's Forest 2020, for more understanding. To kick off these discussions today, we will start the webinar with screening of the film to show how sustainable plantations have helped save Uganda's decimated forests one of the most densely populated countries in Africa. Uganda has been seeing its population double in 12 years, with 95% of the population dependent on toxic charcoal and wood fuel for cooking, the natural forests have shrunk to only 10% of their original cover. Filmmakers James Thompson and Thomas Hogman profile Ugandans who are forging a new path with their innovative approach to harness the strength of sustainable forestry to better their life and livelihoods. I'm sure all of us are going to immensely enjoy watching this film, which would lead on to our discussions today. I must also mention that this film is a part of the short films showcase on our Geo platform, which spotlights exceptional short videos created by filmmakers from around the world and selected by national geographic editors. The editors look for the work that affirms Nat Geo's belief in the power of science, exploration, and storytelling to change the world. Friends, it is time for us to come together and change the world. So let's start with the first small step of listening to experts on how this is best done. I'll stop here and hand it back over to Vanessa to take the proceedings forward. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Vinlendra. I think we can queue up the film now. have cut down trees because they need fuel wood. People have cut down trees because they need to construct homes. It is important that people do have access to forests and timber resources, but this needs to be on a sustainable basis. As we go towards the development of our country, we need power. We need power to run processing facilities, we need power for different activities, most industries. We need power for home consumption. We need power in restaurants. Most of the things we are buying recently, they need charging, you need fridges, you need phones, you need... Everything is running on power. So power is basically needed in our day-to-day -day lives. We have the land and we have the climate where trees can grow. Therefore, growing our own resources, import substitution is just a clear case. Importing means we are spending precious dollars to bring in a resource that we can readily produce at home. Action is needed now 
action was needed actually yesterday in terms of getting people to invest in plantations, getting people to plant a tree, plant two trees, put up a small woodlot, and getting the national consciousness raised on the importance of maintaining the watersheds, of maintaining the biodiversity of our remaining few natural forests. The whole process begins with the mother garden. I have got a very big mother garden of about 20,000 rametes, and that's where we pick our cuttings. Uh, we raise about uh, 500,000 500, seedlings annually. They are using a rooting hormone to stimulate the rooting. After three months, then they will be ready now for planting out into the field. Plantations were very, very important to my upbringing. My family, my brothers and sisters, it was the source of our school fees. And so, if you planted a belt of, of, of plantations around natural forests, you are in one way protecting the natural forest and directly contributing to tourism and to the wildlife they are in. And even up to now, my parents have sold firewood, small bit by bit, but they earn every day. We have sold timber. And remember, we don't have a big piece of land. Our land is about five acres, and that's where we grow food, that's where we stay, that's where we have everything. In my village, a tree, uh, let's say eucalyptus, of uh, 8 to 13 years, ranges between 80,000 and 120,000 per tree. And if you can imagine, most of the school fees for average schools is about uh, 300,000 to 600,000. So that means every term, Five trees can pay fees for your child. These forests are going to release the oxygen which is utilized by the human being for the respiration. This is our oxygen gas. Very good. Can we clap hands for this? I've been here for seven years as a school leader. We have managed to produce over 1,000 professionals. Sandra, you run very fast and tell the warden to come and open for us the genital room. Eh? Being a rural-based school and fat rich school, we don't have power here. And indeed, power has been one of the highest number one challenge of the school. So this is the generator that we are using now. It is a, a petrol-powered generator. Tunurirwa <laughs> Planting trees uh, is not a choice 
that can be debated. The country needs its forests. So it is clear that uh, forests are a necessity for the country. Uh, it is not a luxury that we can easily import um, uh, uh, once things go wrong. I believe in it. New forest is not just a job. I'm a Ugandan too. And no, not all of us have the luxury of getting on a plane and relocating somewhere else. So we've got to make things work here. Yeah, you know? We have to make this thing work here. Beautiful film, James. Um, we're lucky today to have the director of the film, James Thompson, with us for a conversation. James, I just love how your film illustrates the many ways that trees and forestry are integrated with the community. Um, you did a really great job talking to people on the ground there in Uganda. Um, it also illustrates the, de the demands, how the demands for development compete sometimes with forest preservation. Um, there are needs for income for things like school tuition and electricity that people derive from forests, but then also the need to preserve the forest for both environmental and human health as well as tourism. So I'm curious when you were speaking to community members there, um, how did they think they were doing at achieving this balance and did they think this was possible going forward? Hi. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you to FAO for selecting the film and sharing it with everyone today. Um, we shot the film actually two years ago, um, last June, and I think already things are um, slowly improving. Um, I, I can't talk on behalf of um, Ugandan communities, and I think that's why we why we made the film. Um, it's you know, it's also why we've worked hard to, to, to make sure that Alex, um, who was featured in the film, and also some of the pupils at the high school um, were able to join us in this session. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, I would say that I think there is a belief that it, that it can work, and there's a tremendous amount of optimism in Uganda that uh, we weren't expecting. Um, and I think that, that really that gave us a, a lot of energy um, to, to make the film and, and to create a positive picture of what's happening there. Um, the, the mother garden that we see in the film is a really nice example of, of achieving that balance where sustainable forestry is actually embedded in into communities. Um, you have millions of tree saplings nurtured there every year, sold to companies like the New Forest Company and others for, for, for a healthy profit. And um, the, the plantation manager there is also a pastor of a local church, which Stanley stands proudly on that on the grounds of his nursery and of course he's handing out seeds to his congregation um, to plant their own woodlots it's, it's an incredible place um, so i think that's a, a nice example of it working um, i think a lot of communities we visited had abundant supplies of, of fresh local food um, but they lacked the energy infrastructure needed to improve education and also health facilities so then that becomes the, the priority, um, perhaps not so much the environment. Uh, of course, they're, they're interlinked. Um, I think when electricity does arrive in places like Chikanwa, lives will, will change undoubtedly. Um, but will people question where that energy comes from? Um, will wetlands be cleared for large hydroelectric dams? Um, I don't know if, if communities are really a part of that national conversation yet and I think ideas of, of sustainability are, are still sort of the reserve of of the elite and but I'm, I'm confident that our forest high peoples will will prove us uh, prove me wrong so yes good point I mean I think that's why it's so important as you did in your film to be highlighting the voices of the people who actually live um, 
in the in the in the forestry community. Um, so I, you did an excellent job doing that. And what an interesting thing about you personally is that in addition to being a filmmaker, you also have a degree in environmental sustainability. Um, I'm curious how you came to choose to be a filmmaker and to use film as a tool for inspiring people to support sustainability efforts like forest conservation. Sure, um, it, it's just kind of a natural thing to, to fall into really. Um, it's a great way to uh, collaborate with different people, bring communities, um, companies, governments together, um, work out ideas, amplify voices that are that aren't heard as, 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 as much in, in the media. Um, so, you know, I had a degree in photography already and it was just a natural combination. But, um, so yeah, that, that, that's how it came about. But, um, you know, I think going to a place like Uganda, um, we're not there to, to, to sort of pick apart what's, what's going wrong there. We're also learning um, ourselves as, as, as filmmakers and um, as citizens of Scotland, um, I think, you know, there are comparisons. Uh, the forest cover in Scotland is 12% um, and very, very low indeed. So I think, you know, we can learn something about the way Uganda has managed to protect its wildlife, its forests, for not just for biodiversity, but also um, tourism. And uh, yeah, I think that um, we, we learn a hell of a lot there. I think that's, that's why I, I make films is, is to, is to understand um, if you're learning in the process, then other people will, will learn with you. That's right. I know, you know, I personally believe they're an excellent way of elevating voices and, and starting conversations like the one we're having today. So thanks so much for um, allowing us to showcase your work and being here to speak with us today. Thank you, James. Thank you. Um, yes. And um, our next speaker, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce as our keynote, co keynote speaker, Kathy Abuso, President and CEO of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for the opportunity to um, speak here today on the FAO Nat Geo event. That was an inspiring film. And, um, and I think one of the great opportunities is use local stories to help build emotional context of how a world can value and benefit from sustainably managed forests, which is our, our mission, our vision, and we do that through collaboration. And so um, there's a big difference though I want to point out between deforestation and sustainable forest management. They're on opposite ends of the scale. Deforestation is when you have forest loss. It's not a forest again and it's been uh, converted to another use um, and that is void of a lot of values that are provided with sustainable forest management which was about the story we just heard and how sustainably managed forests can help the planet and they can do that one local community at a time but and part of the challenge is to be able to um, benefit from the wide variety of values that come from sustainably managed forests one local community at a time but through scale and so what do all of these relevant global issues have in common they can all be addressed and uplifted through sustainably managed forests and sustainable communities and collaboration and one of the things that we do at SFI is uh, quite a bit of programming um, that addresses the sustainable development goals as it relate as it relates to um, some of the ones up here on the screen. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you a little bit today is how the purchase of sustainably sourced products can make a difference um, to to uh, promoting sustainable forest management how you can collaborate for positive conservation outcomes, and why it's essential to increase access to environmental education. Um, first of all, as I said, you have one community at a time, and hopefully with that, you start to spread the word and get scale. 
Um, SFI operates in North America where we have about 115 million hectares certified to our standard. Now what that means is those standards, those fours are um, responsible for meeting many of the goals and requirements set out in the SDGs and um, uh, sustainable forest management indicators and criteria. But what's interesting is you um, have a world that only 11% of the world's forests are certified. So it's and, and SFI has a big portion of what's certified, but it's critically important to understand there's 90% of those forests that aren't certified. So we can't stop here with the expectation, start here with the expectation of audits. We need to start at local communities, finding collaboratives to promote sustainable forest management as per the video we saw today and ensure that those communities can sustain themselves and hopefully grow to actually grow markets and achieve revenue and have a wide variety of other values. Um, and one of the things that we know is that when um, many corporations around the world announce commitments for zero deforestation, they also wanted to ensure that they were purchasing products responsibly. And there are ways to do that. Um, we've developed a forest partners program that National Geographic, Hearst and Macmillan um, support to help the growth of certification and um, and uh, and that can be on indigenous lands it can be on community lands it can be on um, private lands and that um, is funding that supports to pay for um, responsible forest management of the resource but certification is really a check mark um, to say that the forest is well managed, but what do you do with those forests beyond that is what we were seeing in that video and what's so important today. So one of the things that we're trying to do with these forests that are certified is knit them together at the landscape scale and say, okay, um, how can we identify the best management practices for water quality? How can we maintain and or recover species in decline? How can we sequester more carbon through best management practices on this land? And so again, to address sustainability issues through forest focused collaboration, we have a wide variety of partnerships and, and a grants program that does this. So a few little case studies is we're working with the American Bird Conservancy to look at species in decline, forest bird species in decline that are along the flyway from Canada's boreal to the US South, and then figuring out what, working with the land managers and the forest managers to say what sort of habitat is required for these species to recover them. And this is exactly the types of programs that we're doing and using that scale and that landscape to have even a larger impact beyond each forest being sustainably managed, but looking at the interactions of species needs across those forests. Likewise, all eyes are um, very focused today on addressing climate change. So we have a, a wide variety of partnership programs that are assessing the carbon stored and fluxes on our footprint that's been certified. And we're also working with universities to look at what are the best management practices in our standards that sequester more carbon. And in our standard revision, we're putting in a climate smart forestry objective so that we can provide guidance and um, as well as requirements on how to achieve climate smart forestry in, um, while implementing sustainable forest management. Now, one thing that people don't know, not, well, not everyone um, knows, is that forests, when they're growing, sequester carbon. When a, when a forest or a tree is harvested and that is turned into a, a product like this solid wood product, that product continues to store the carbon. And so when you regenerate the forest and a new tree grows, you're getting more carbon sequestered in that tree. And then you're um, harvesting that tree and getting more carbon. What's important though, is the prompt regeneration. Um, uh, I remember when we were speaking to one of the youth that we're gonna be hearing from today, they said the, the goal is to plant three trees for every one you harvest. And I think that is just a wonderful goal to have to ensure that we're constantly increasing our carbon storage and our carbon um, sequestration and forest products. 
Now, one of the things I'd like to turn to now is the role of environmental education. And um, at the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, we took on an environmental education program called Project Learning Tree. And um, we're hoping to expand this program globally. And it really helps to um, uh, uh, provide opportunities for youth to learn about the environment through trees and forests as windows onto the world and it helps teachers with learning activities and exercises as well. And we would like nothing more than to collaborate with many organizations to bring some of these tools that have been developed um, around the world. And so some of our, the most recent tools that we've developed are a carbon and climate guide and an energy and ecosystems guide um, for grades three to five and six to eight. And they've won Teacher's Choice Awards, which means they're engaging, they're understandable, you can have fun with them outdoors. And, um, and other award winners include National Geographic, Scholastic, uh, of other um, programs. We've also trying to really build um, a, a, K th a kindergarten through grade eight guide on forest literacy. And what should we be learning about trees and forests from preschool right up to grade eight? And then once you're in high school, how can we start learning about green jobs and exploring forest careers? And one of the things that we just did in April on Earth Day was work with National Geographic Explorer magazine to talk about green career pathways and bring some of these um, green jobs to life and helping um, the readers of their, their magazine understand all of the different jobs just to keep a forest sustainably managed and letting them know um, how to pursue those career pathways. And we're also really committed to giving job experiences. They might only be four to 16 weeks, but to giving these um, experiences to high school students and university students in our network. And just in the past few years, since 2018, we've placed about 2,500 youth in green jobs in the forest and park sector and um, to hopefully stimulate some of them aren't students yet hopefully some of them are at risk students and we hope that through these job experiences they'll be very get be more interested in forest and the environment and want to pursue a career pathway and then we work to provide scholarships and sponsorship programs and partnerships to help with that pursuit and we're thrilled that we've achieved gender balance in these jobs and that 10% of those jobs have um, been provided to Indigenous youth. So I just want to um, you know, close by reminding us that sustainably managed forests provide many benefits. It's at the opposite end of deforestation. And if you um, want to um, look at and learn a little bit more, hopefully we're traveling again um, next year, our conference will be focused on growing um, solutions. And if you wanted to hear more about um, deforestation versus sustainable forest management, I did a TEDx talk several years ago um, on this very issue because a lot of corporations were misunderstanding deforestation and they thought it meant not procuring sustainably produced forest products. Not doing that means you're going to undermine communities, you're going to undermine sustainably managed forests. So it's important to understand that part of the solution is sustainably managed forests, the communities, and the procurement of forest products that are responsibly sourced. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing all the great work you're doing at SFI. Um, how I especially love the Green Jobs Initiative, and I'm sure we have um, some young people joining us today. How can young people get involved in something like this? Um, well, absolutely. First of all, we um, if you go to pltcanada.org, there's all sorts of tools and career paths and 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 links and resources and even short videos of youth in these green jobs and so i think that's a great way um, to to learn about some of these and if you're an educator um, there's a variety of career guides as well that we're developing to highlight um, highlight those jobs and then um, we have a matching database where we can place youth in these jobs with those in the SFI network that are looking to give those job experiences. Wonderful, thanks so much. I'm looking forward to sharing that. I'm sure a lot of people over on the National Geographic Education team will be interested to learn more about what you're doing. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Meta Wilkie, who is the Director of Forestry Policy and Resource Division at UNFAO. Um, her group just published the 2020 State of the World's Forest Report, and Meta will be sharing some of these findings with us now. Meta? Yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, and thanks for inviting me for this event. It's fantastic to be here. Um, FAO publishes what we call the State of the World's Forest every two years. And this year, for the first time, we teamed up with the United Nations Environment Program and the World Conservation Monitoring Center. And the reason we did that was that we wanted to focus this edition on forest biodiversity and people, simply because 2020 is the last year of the UN decade on biodiversity. So we wanted to have a publication that celebrates the diversity of forest ecosystems and all the benefits that they bring to people. We also wanted to have a look at progress towards specific targets and goals related to forest biodiversity. And lastly, we wanted to make the case to make sure that forests are a central pillar in the new global biodiversity framework that's being developed this year and next year. So let me take you on a journey, but first talk a little bit about what we are using to get this information to you. We used a very wide variety of ex existing literature, but we were also lucky in that FAO also published what we call the Global Forest Resources Assessment every five years. So 2020 coincided with that. We had some special studies prepared for this edition of the State of the World's Forest to look at forest intactness and fragmentation, the links between forest and poverty, and looking at trends in protected areas by forest type rather than by country. And then we had a number of case studies developed specifically to look at local solutions that could come up with ideas for how you can have a positive result for both people and the planet. So let's have a look at the world's forest. Um, they cover about 31% of the land area, just over 4 billion hectares. And, and as you can see from this picture, they appear from the far north to the far south, and they are very diverse. That, of course, makes it very difficult to come up with some global messages that are valid for all of them. But what we did here, we were trying to compile at least five key messages for decision makers and others involved in forestry that we wanted them to, to take away with them. So I'll be presenting those uh, to you today as well. The first one is about the biodiversity. And forests are home to the vast majority of the terrestrial biodiversity in terms of both plants and animals. There are more than 60,000 different tree species in the world. And most of the plants are found in tropical forest. 80% of all amphibian species, three quarters of all bird species, and more than two thirds of all mammal species all live in forests. And we're not just talking about terrestrial biodiversity. Forests along rivers provide shade and nutrients. And in the coastal areas in the tropics, you have mangroves that provide breeding grounds and feeding grounds for a lot of fish and shellfish, and they also protect coral reefs for, from sedimentation from the land. So they are containing a lot of the terrestrial biodiversity, but also supporting the aquatic one. This means that the conservation of the world's forest is utterly dependent on the way in which we interact with and use the world's forest. So all the world's biodiversity is dependent on how we use our forest. That's our first message. The second message is that all people depend upon forests and their biodiversity, some of them more than others, but we all do. Forests provide the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, and much of the food that we eat. And they help mitigate and adapt to climate change. Just a couple of facts here. Three quarters of all the accessible fresh water comes from forested watersheds. And 87 out of the 115 leading food species that together account for 35% of the global food production, they benefit from animal pollination. And many of these animals also live in forests. 
But forests also provide essential products, livelihoods and well-being. They provide more than 86 million green jobs. You heard about some of them already. But it's also livelihoods. Uh, we have also seen in the film from Uganda about people collecting fewer wood and charcoal and more than 880 million people do so. And 2.4 billion people across the world, both in rural and urban areas, use fuel wood for cooking their daily meals. More than a billion people depend on wild food. It could be fish and can be meat. Um, it can be berries and mushrooms. And many of the more than 28,000 plants that are known to have medicinal use come from forests. I also think that during this uh, COVID pandemic, we have all discovered that a walk in the park or in the forest has a positive impact both of our physical and mental health and well-being. So there's a very strong link between forest and human well-being. Unfortunately, my third message is that despite all of these benefits and despite some progress, deforestation and forest degradation continue at quite alarming rates. That global forest resources assessment that I referred to earlier tells us that we're still losing 10 million hectares of forest each year. They're converted to other uses. It's down from 16 million hectares in the 1990s, but it's still twice the size of the country of Costa Rica. And every three years, we're losing an area that's the size of Italy. So it's quite substantial. And although we are also gaining some forest, either from natural expansion or because they are planted or seeded, those that we lose and those that we gain are very different. Most of the forests we gain are found in the temperate and boreal zones, while most of the forests we lose are located, located in the tropics and subtropics. The main driver of deforestation and forest degradation is the expansion of agriculture, with large scale agriculture accounting for some 40% and small scale agriculture for about 33. It varies between regions and in countries, but agriculture continues to be the major driver of deforestation. But we also wanted to look not just at the forest and the forest area, but what was happening under the canopy. And deforestation is not the only important factor affecting forest biodiversity. We conducted a global study of the relationship between forest cover change and population of vertebrate species. And it doesn't reveal a simple relationship. And that's because there are other important factors such as unsustainable exploitation, it could be hunting, could be for other purposes. But applying the Living Planet Index approach to data from hundreds of studies of forest dwelling animals worldwide revealed a decline of more than 50% since 1970. This, what we call the Forest Specialist Index, is a new way to monitor what's going on below the canopy. So our fourth message is this, that solution that balance conservation and sustainable use are critical, but also that they are possible. Actions to combat deforestation and illegal logging have gathered pace in recent years. Thanks in particular to the inclusion of forests in the climate change agreement and the result-based payments for reduction of deforestation and degradation in developing countries. Countries have also pledged to restore more than 170 million hectares of degraded forest and other landscapes. And what we call the ITU Biodiversity Target 11, which is to protect at least 17% of terrestrial area by 2020, has already been exceeded for forests as a whole. Let me just talk a little bit about that last one, because our colleagues at the UN Environment Programme World Conservation Monitoring Centre took a deeper look at the trends in protected areas over time. And as you can see from this graph, there's been a very significant increase in the period from 1992 to 2015. Most of it is orange, that's broadleaf evergreen forest, such as those found in, in the tropics. If we look at forest types globally, there are some 
20 global ecological zones that contain some form of tree cover. And in three of these, the tropical rainforest, the subtropical dry forest, and the temperate oceanic forest, more than 30% of all the tree cover is now found in what we call legally protected areas. The state of the world's forest also contains numerous examples and 10 case studies that describe these local solutions that combine conservation and sustainable use of forests and their biodiversity. And they range from large scale dryland restoration in Africa to community concessions in Guatemala, forest and freshwater conservation in North America, and panda friendly use of medicinal plants in China. And I really encourage you to have a look at what we call SOFO 2020, the State of the World's Forest 2020, and these case studies that we have in there. Now, we all know that negative trends in biodiversity undermine progress towards all of the sustainable development goals. So our last and most important message to the world is this. We must take bold action to reverse the loss of forests and their biodiversity for the benefit of people and the planet. We must protect, manage and restore our forests and their biodiversity. To protect forests, we do need to transform our food systems to halt the deforestation that's caused by expansion of agriculture. To manage, we need to ensure positive results and outcomes for both biodiversity and people. And this requires a very careful balance between conservation and sustainable use. And lastly, we need to restore and repair the damage that has done to the environment and to the livelihoods of people by scaling up restoration efforts. Since forest restoration helps restore habitats and ecosystems, it creates jobs and it's an effective nature-based solution to climate change. Thank you very much. This is where you can find some more information about this publication. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meta. It's a fascinating report. I've, I've read through it. Um, what was interesting to me is that preventing deforestation is not enough, right? We need to also uh, engage in reforestation projects. Um, I'm curious how can communities and individuals be a part of this effort? Do you have any recommendations for how, um, how we can be involved on an individual and small community level? Absolutely, and as we've seen in the, in the film from Uganda, there are efforts on the way in many countries already. But one thing that will create that momentum for everybody to work together is the next decade that the UN has. Well, it has a number of them, but one of the ones that it has that starts in 2021 is the United Nations Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. It's not just about forests, it's about all ecosystems. And it's about repairing that damage that has been done already. So FAO together with the United Nations Environment Program, again, uh, are co-leading that effort. So we have been reaching out to um, stakeholders across the world. We've had a number of consultation meetings with governments and in connection with some big uh, international meetings. We've had a number of consultations that's done by a youth organization that reach out to other youth organizations to find out how they can be involved in this. Because it is not enough to look at how we can do something in a small area or we can do something at a large scale. We all need to be involved and we all can be involved. This is about restoring the quality of the local environment that we have. It's about planting trees in the schoolyard. It's about cleaning up the local a little dam or lake it's about some beach cleaning up it's about looking at how we can do that and we can each be involved in that we also need to do it at large scale so we're trying to see how we can get both governments who have committed to that but also the private sector and investors to be involved in that and that's where i think forestry and and planting of trees has a huge potential simply because it has other benefits as well so it creates those green jobs it does protect the biodiversity, but importantly as well, it mitigates climate change, as we also heard from Kathy. So there are private sectors that are engaged and increasingly uh, wanting to be involved in this simply because they see that's a way to also help with the climate change challenge that we have. Thank you. And I think the message I'd also like to convey is that there, 
this is a very hopeful um, decade, right? We, these sorts of um, restoration projects are, can, are possible. And I know we at National Geographic have done several um, film series and magazine articles about community conservation efforts that have brought back species that had previously been extinct and seen a real regeneration in their ecosystems. Uh, so I, I'd Absolutely. like Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I'm one of the focal points for, for the decade together with one of my colleagues in FAO and, and one from UNEP. And I've sort of been promoting the tagline saying, restoring ecosystems, restoring hope. And it is just about that. And I think there's a link to all of the sustainable development goals. There's a real link to, to seeing this as something positive everybody can be involved in from age five to 95, at least. Great, I, I agree, I love that, thank you. Well, our next guest we're very fortunate to have. Um, you'll recognize him as one of the subjects in our film today, A Journey Without a Map. Alex Chapawampi has, um, also brings a unique perspective today as both an employee of the New Forest Company and a member of the community where the company operates. Um, Alex, are, you have an interesting role at New Forest Company as the head of corporate social responsibility. Can you tell us about your work leading the company's community development program? Uh, th thank you, Vanessa. Uh, New Forest Company is uh, a certified, successful, vertically integrated greenfield forest, forestry and timber processing company. We have been operating in Uganda since 2005. We have three plantations. Uh, covering almost 22,000 hectares, most of it from formerly degraded land, a pole treatment plant, and a sawmill. About 40% of our land holding is actually reserved for conservation. And the main parts we have are poles, transmission, telephone, building poles, structural timber, uh, pallets, and renewable energy. Uh, our main customers are rural electrification agencies, and beverage logistic companies with a commitment to sustainability for pallets. The NFC business philosophy is really what attracted me to New Forest in the first place. It's based on creating shared value, based on three pillars, which is commerce, conservation, and, 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 and community, really. And uh, my particular responsibility, as you mentioned in New Forest, is that C, which deals with community. And if any, we believe if any of these pillars fails, then the other two also fail. So it's not a question of one versus the other. There are three pillars. It is a stool with, without one leg, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And this is something that we have vividly seen uh, during this period when we have been going through the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, those of us who are on the front line of managing the relationship between community and company you know, there is no isolation. There is no imaginary boundary line. Uh, in the community work, uh, the company partners with the New Forest Foundation to do community development, community engagement, and upliftment. Uh, some of the joint initiatives which excite me include the community payment uh, for risk management on the plantations. We call it Forest for Prosperity a term that was coined in a collaborative and participatory manner with uh, the forest adjacent communities. The other aspect is formalization of community tree growers association into the NFC uh, supply chain, plus various livelihoods augmentation programs, such as apiculture, whereby uh, hives uh, and other things are placed in the 40% area of, of the NFC uh, conservation, uh, so that uh, communities get added benefits out of that and then agroforestry, and then access to a microfinance uh, partner for savings. In all this, we use the uh, few free prior informed consent, whereby we sit and we co-design community projects, building trust as well as agency, while helping mitigate uh, against climate change with both our community partners and the local governments that we, we, we work with. That's Thank you. That's very interesting. I love the concept of co-designing community projects. Is that how um, some of these ideas like the beehives in the conservation area and the microfinance programs came about? Through these co-developed co and co-designed projects? Uh, uh, absolutely, because uh, 
under the shared value uh, process, we, we, we are looking to see aligned interests between uh, the, 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 the objectives of the company and the objectives of the community. So this involves a process usually spanning eight, 12 months sitting down with the different communities we are and saying, hey, what does prosperity look for you? What does success look for you? We want a forest to be there, but we also want you to be there. It is not exclusivity. There's a certain common space that we must share, both you and the plantation. So how best do we do that in a way that speaks to the interests of all of us? So that's where the, 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 the new forest shared value concept comes in. And that is what actually gave root uh, uh, rise to the, to, the, to the Forest for Prosperity program uh, that, 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 that we're speaking about. Um, I'm curious, what are some of the challenges you've encountered in um, initiating this approach? The, some of the challenges that we, 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 we encounter really is first of all, um, aligning interests is, is, is a long-term community process. It's participatory. You must give yourself the time. Uh, you must be able to come with a mindset of listening. So in, in, in a way, CSR in New Forest is in this curious position of really being like uh, a mediator. We have the company, we have the community, and we are trying to facilitate these two parties to come together to see how best each one can have their interests being met in that process. And this has worked out for both the the, the, the FP, the Forest for Prosperity, in terms of the risk mitigation, but also in the process of formalizing the outgrowers into the NFC supply chains. We have seen that outgrowers have very many challenges. One of our experience we in Uganda is that people, for new forests, is that people want to plant trees, but they face so many challenges from access to good quality uh, inputs like seedlings, the whole question of land use, these are people who usually have very little uh, land holdings. You heard that from the film, five acres, that's a well-off a well family. So how do you give them information, technical skills and knowledge to say, what is the best land use you can do? Things like agroforestry. You want to plant a bit of trees, but you must use also that same land must support you in all your other needs. And this is an, an ongoing conversation with our outgrowers to see how best do we support you to motivate you to do this important work, incidentally, which is very long term, because the benefits from trees, the commercial effects, uh, are long term. If you're looking at pine and eucalyptus, of course, there are other species where agroforestry comes in, where they, are, they, they grow indigenous and fruit thick trees, uh, which speak to food, uh, species which help with firewood, fast maturing. But the, 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 the mutual area or the aligned interest with the company comes into uh, the, 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 the products that can feed into its supply chain. So the company comes with this, uh, in working with the outgrowers, we've been saying, how do we def design a program that speaks to their holistic needs while also providing something for the company? And one of the biggest things we've seen in these two issues for outgrowers is the need for a microfinance partner to provide some support for the shocks uh, and then also the relationship with New Forest assuring them of a market when somebody grows their trees and they, are, they, they have finally uh, matured. Where do they get a market? Not from middlemen. You heard from the film, uh, Martin speaking of a tree going for between 80 to 120,000 Uganda shillings. A middleman will want to give a farmer 20,000, 30,000. NFC guaranteeing a market mitigates that risk. So the whole balance of the company working with the community is about creating an arena for building agency and sitting down together and saying, how can we join forces uh, to fight poverty, to, to build agency, to fight marginalization in ways that reinforce each other to help us combat uh, climate change. Interesting. I love your quote at the end of the film um, where you say, you have to make things work in your home country. Um, have you seen have you seen progress, and are you hopeful that you're you're on the right path? Yes, there has been plenty of progress. I really want to thank James for the film. He said it was two years ago. One positive note uh, I was reading in the local press recently: the director of our national forestry authority saying the decline it has been steep, about 122,000 hectares per year being lost uh, for the last 20 years in Uganda. 
And he was saying that the decline is, it seems it's slowing down, it, 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 it is being reduced. We might be reaching a plateau. So it's early days yet, uh, but there is, that, there is that progress. And why is that so? That is so because I believe one of the issues is that more and more people are participating in planting trees for one reason or another. They work in new forests that we do in Uganda. I think we are working with 6,000 uh, outgrowers and there are other companies. Uh, there is a big uh, seedling distribution program by the NFA itself. There has been a lot of support by the what we call the solo, solo production scheme, which is managed by the FAO in giving subsidies to the people who want to plant trees. And it was interesting in this third phase that they opened up what we call the community aspect because before they used to put a limit of 25 hectares for somebody to participate. But this time they said, if people, local people in a village can come together and combine and demonstrate that they can put together 25 hectares, they would work with them. And I have evidence that in the places where New Forest works as part of our work uh, in CSR, we have helped organize people to come together and build their capacity to be able to participate and benefit from the SPGS program. So there, there is progress uh, in that regard, but that progress can only be sustained, I believe, because for the last 10, 15 years, more and more people have been planting trees. We need to wait for the next two, three years to find out whether the trend will be reversed because we need to confirm that the, the people who are now about to harvest or who have started harvesting will actually replant. And that requires them to be motivated. And that motivation requires us to address certain bottlenecks. I think one of the colleague panelists mentioned it um, uh, in the market. So one of the things that we are looking at seriously is saying to address this challenge, probably in a holistic manner, we need to go the landscape approach. Individuals like New Forest putting up your own forest estate just, just won't do it. We need to look at an entire landscape where you have the nucleus company with its nucleus estate, the forest adjacent neighbors, the local government, the other stakeholders, civil society, central government. These have important roles to play in setting the right tone, the environment, the regulatory framework in order to make uh, investment in forestry uh, profitable which will be what motivates individuals to reinvest in planting trees. And that is core in a, a, a country like Uganda with, this, with, 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 with our high population density that is, that is ballooning every year, literally. And the land, land area is not increasing. Urbanization is at a very uh, uh, small, small, small portion of the population. So what do you do? We need to look at options that give that provide for sustainable land use in an integrated manner that rural populations can be able to get, increase the productivity from the, the, the small land parcels that they hold. We and, are and, oh, sorry, I was going to say, and um, you're, we're now looking at bringing up a, the next generation to be part of this effort. And um, I know we're, we're really fortunate to have some <laughs> very special guests that Alex knows well as, as well. <laughs> um, coming to us from Forest High School in Uganda, which was featured in today's film, um, Owen Samata and Ag Agnes Nasanda, who will share their perspectives on the importance of sustainable forestry. Agnes and Owen, thanks so much for joining us. I think you have some things prepared to tell, tell the group today. Yeah. Um, Agnes Nasanda a student of Forest High School, Kassanda District in Chikandwa Village. Uh, for us to protect forests for sustainable livelihood, we have to live alone deforestation. And not only living alone deforestation, but we have also to plant more trees. And I have come up with some of the causes of deforestation in our country. One is Poverty, since we lack electricity in our, country, in our district, so some people end up depleting the forest to get charcoal or fuel, and others to get money. Another one is poverty. Ne no. Another one is overpopulation. In Uganda today, the population is increasing rapidly 
whereby we are having now 43 million people of which 15 million people are school going children. So remember, the population is increasing rapidly, but the land is not increasing. So people end up practicing deforestation to get more land, carry on their activities and for settlement. And as Alex said, please let people make things work in your own country. And as my ambition is to become a doctor, I will keep on advising people to plant trees with the crops so as to improve on their diet. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. And now Owen. Um, same at Owen, aged 18 years, I born out Kandwa area that is located uh, in Kasanda district. Uh, the problems that we have that uh, for us to protect forests for sustainable livelihood, how just to live alone deforestation. And as my fellow has pointed out, that one of the causes of deforestation is lack of power. And I'm happy because I heard that there's an ongoing campaign of bringing electricity to our site. And electricity will do decrease on uh, like the uh, forest, like the deforestation in such a way that people will at least use electricity as a source of fuel instead of cutting down trees. And power will not only be used just for like to protect our forest, we we'll also have like here at school be uh, capable of revising during the night preps uh, so that we make our grades good. Eh? Others, uh, since electricity can provide a cheaper source of power compared to these power generators, and just facilitating the, the solar panel, like buying regulators, ba batteries, and so on. So people will just get a cheaper source of power, thus, thus establishing industries in our area. And that will reduce on the poverty levels of people in our area. And in such a way, it will also protect forests because some of the causes of deforestation is poverty. People do look for money, like they cut, they burn charcoal to look for money. If our like, industries are brought in our area due to electricity that will arrive soon, then that will give people a chance and even for us to live. Uh, my message to the world is that if, for instance, you cut one tree, let us plan like 14 to replace those cut one. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Th thank you both of you for joining us today. It's really important to hear your perspective on uh, sustainable forestry and um, the issues like, like power and school tuition and that, that you have brought up. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Huma Khan, our final speaker. As World Wildlife Fund's global communication lead for forests, Huma collaborated with James on today's film as part of her work to develop stories and content about World Wildlife Fund's forest work across the globe. Huma. Thank you, Vanessa, and uh, thank you, FAO and National Geographic Society for inviting me to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, it is uh, really heartening to hear the diverse views. Um, and I think uh, the one common message we're hearing is that the need to tackle deforestation and forest degradation has never been greater. Uh, at WWF, our mission is to create a world where people and nature thrive together. Um, our vision is of a world enriched by extensive, resilient forest landscapes that benefit biodiversity, people, as well as climate. 
And by 2030, we're working to end deforestation, protect and improve the management of the world's forests and help restore forest landscapes around the world. As we've heard today uh, from Mete and many others, uh, deforestation continues to be a big threat. And uh, though it, the rate of loss may have declined, um, its deforestation globally continues to increase. Most of this loss is in the tropics and subtropics, and that's particularly alarming because these regions are home to more than half of the world's forests. Um, our research shows that by far the greatest driver of deforestation is agriculture. However, there are a number of other pressures on forests, for example, coming from extractive industries that lead to fragmentation and over time deforestation. So it is important to address those as well and not overlook them either. And what our work and recent trends show that deforestation will continue to rise unless there is concerted and collective action that is tailored to each country and region. We've heard about the work that's going on in Uganda and it is important uh, based on our experience that unless we take local communities and local stakeholders on the journey to address the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation, the responses will not be successful. We have made good progress in lowering the rate of deforestation in some countries. Um, Area-based responses in particular have contributed to halting deforestation in local contexts, but given the scale of the problem, we need to do more. We know that one single response is not going to be enough to address the scale of the problem and address this, this issue of rising deforestation. We need tailored and we need integrated responses that take local communities and local contexts into account that include the voices of all the stakeholders and that work for nature, but also people. And we at WWF, we want to see a world where forests are properly valued for the many, many benefits they provide, whether it's clean air and water, whether it is wood, and we know it is possible. Um, we, with better protection, forests can provide a welcome home for wildlife. They can help stabilize the climate and provide resources such as clean water uh, to local communities, as well as indigenous people who rely directly on forest resources. And with sustainable management, we can meet the growing demand for wood products without damaging the local environment. And it is a very important com component of also providing sustainable livelihoods for local communities and indigenous people. Um, in a few weeks time, we at WWF will be launching a new platform called Forest Forward, and it brings together communities, businesses, governments, um, financial is institutions, as well as civil society organizations to advance sustainable forest management and trade. And with better planning, with better land use planning, we can halt deforestation and produce enough food without having to convert forests to farmland. And we can go even further by replanting and restoring forests, taking a full landscape approach. And this can help address climate change, extend and reconnect wildlife habitats and reduce problems like flooding and erosion. What the key is that we need the involvement of all stakeholders. We need governments, national governments, regional governments, local governments, companies that have local companies as well as global companies that have a footprint, consumers, youth organizations, civil society organizations, and most importantly, indigenous people and local communities who are the best stewards of forests. We need the financial community to be more closely involved in raising awareness about the risk of deforestation, both from a financial perspective as well as a livelihood perspective. Now, th there are examples of landscape level approaches that have shared benefit for all stakeholders. Uh, we just heard about this concept of shared benefit and how it is important to ensure that all stakeholders are on board. I'd like to highlight two cases in particular um, because they're, they're good examples of approaches that have involved a diverse group of stakeholders. And um, we've heard a lot about Uganda and so I'm going to move a little bit away and uh, focus on this example from Latin America. Um, and it is really interesting because one thing we, we have seen is that across the board, the challenges that communities face, the challenges that companies face and governments face are quite similar. 
However, the approaches need to be adapted to the local context. In this particular, particular community in Oaxaca, Mexico, um, there, were, there has been huge forest loss. Um, forests have been cleared uh, to make way for agriculture. They've been affected by fire and climate change. And that in turn had a huge impact on the water quality and quantity. It eroded the soil. It undermined, it undermined the livelihoods of local communities. So WWF working in conjunction with a number of local organizations, including a youth group um, led by a leader who was very passionate about bringing change to her community, tried to develop locally led solutions to managing forest, soil, and water in a way that benefits people and nature. The goal was to ensure that everyone in the landscape had enough clean water to meet their needs that meant working across the watershed on everything from training farmers to use water more efficiently, to restoring native trees around water courses, to training communities to monitor water quality. Uh, there's more information about this on our website if you'd like to read more. But the main lesson learned is that it is important to include local communities, in this case, particularly women and youth who led a lot of the local cooperatives in decision making from the start. And that is a key component of, of success on the ground. Another example I'd like to highlight is a new landscape reserve in Russia. Uh, new is a relative term. This was created um, at the end of last year and it came, it came out of 17 years of advocacy efforts um, led by WWF and other civil society organizations. And uh, there are not there are very few places on earth uh, that still hold large expanses of pristine forest, um, large intact forests, and Russia is one of them. And this particular landscape is, is increasingly rare. Local communities have relied on it for hundreds of years uh, for hunting and fishing, collecting local mushrooms, berries, and medicinal plants. Um, but this particular part of um, forest, intact forest landscape in Russia was under tremendous pressure because there was um, unsustainable logging. Once companies fully harvested on one side, they just moved on to another. There were no effective forestry operations, no thinning or replanting. Um, so our estimates showed that if the current trends continued, this taiga forest could become extinct in 15 to 20 years. Um, and also impacting the very many ecosystem services that this forest holds for local communities and the country and region as a whole. And working with local timber companies, working with local communities, working with the regional government, uh, this landscape reserve was created. And it was really interesting because forestry companies may seem like unlikely advocates for a protected reserve, but in this case, they actually recognized that it was important for their own future. It was important for the viability of future wood supply. So again, an example of something that can work. Um, it is important to have long-term commitment and collaboration among all the key stakeholders and to involve everyone from the start. And just finally, I'd like to highlight um, the current situation we have all been affected by, which is COVID-19. Um, it has really highlighted the many vulnerabilities of societies around the world. But I think what it has really showed us inevitably is that human health and planetary health are linked. Uh, we might not see that connection directly, but it is very clear. And we know that land use changes, which include deforestation and forest degradation, have contributed to almost half of the emerging zoonotic diseases in humans. And it is directly connected to how we use land, how we produce and consume food, how we use land to meet our, our daily needs. And increasing forest loss, land conversion, among other factors like illegal wildlife trade are all contributing to dangerous environments that lead to the spillovers of diseases, the jumping of disease from animals to humans. So we're at a time where we face a profound question, both at the global level, at the country level, at the local level, how can we provide enough healthy food within planetary boundaries? How can we use land in a sustainable way to meet the needs of a global population that, that will top 10 billion within three decades while halting deforestation, while addressing climate change and reversing the loss of nature? And I think we're at a very critical juncture 
and how we build um, in the post-recovery phase will be very important for people and nature alike. We at WWF are calling for a new deal for nature and people, one that ensures that the voices of local and indigenous communities are heard to protect, restore, and maintain the resources that sustain us all. And the immense disruption that has been caused by COVID-19, it gives us license to think big. In 2021, we can look forward to the UN Climate and Biodiversity Conferences, as well as the UN Food System Summit. And this is an unmissable opportunity to shape a better world, a world in which there is enough healthy food for everyone, a world in which there are enough resources for everyone, equitable resources, and, and one in which we avoid dangerous climate change and protect and safeguard our forests and reverse the loss of nature. And my final message is just um, let's use this crisis as an opportunity to change things for the better. Thank you, Huma. Uh, very interesting. And uh, we're now begin, we have time for a short question and answer, answer session with our panelists. Um, so I will begin. We have a lot of great questions from our audience today. We'll have to um, narrow it down and ask just a few. The first is, um, I think, relevant to Huma in particular. How can we accelerate our understanding of this need to protect forests all over the world? How are you communicating all of the wonderful ideas you shared in your presentation? That's a very good question. And it, it again, is something that involves working across, um, across the stakeholders. We need to influence these global agreements that are happening, but we need to influence national policymakers as well. And again, I cannot reiterate this enough, really involve local communities and take, up, take local youth organizations and civil society organizations on this journey, whether it is planting a tree in your backyard or whether it's advocating for deforestation-free commitments um, from companies and governments. I think at every level, we need to raise awareness uh, about the loss of nature, about the loss of forests and, and how important it is um, in our daily lives. Thank you. Does anyone else have, um, any of our other panelists like to add to that? How are you communicating some of the ideas you shared with us today? I'd just like to add that I think it's important when we talk about how do we protect our forests. I think what this conversation is demonstrating is how do we protect the variety of forest values, like the variety of value services and benefits that come from forests while engaging local communities. Um, and I think that's um, a knowledge uh, that's evolving, that um, people are increasingly understanding that sustainable use leads to sustainable communities, and that can be done in a way that um, builds new forests or prevents forest loss as opposed to putting a fence around something in a strict form of protection and not enabling um, communities to benefit from that. And so I think we're in a, next, in, in a new generation where protection means um, sustainable forest management for multiple values to sustain people and the forest and, and all of those values that come from it. And I think um, that's that's really critical um, to understand and I know that even with the new protected area targets that have been set that are so important they're now looking at um, not just strictly protected areas but other effective conservation measures known as OECMs and that is how can you get the same conservation outcomes um, as you do on a strictly protected area, but while having forest management. And I think this is an evolution uh, um, that's just super important if we want to sustain communities. Yes, that's a great point. And I think that's, that's something that many of our panelists touched on today and a real change in thinking in the, in the conservation world. And I think um, that's something, at, we have another question that's related that I think Alex can address is how can we use business and the private sector um, to, to, how can we encourage businesses and the private sector to use these sorts of sustainable practices and engage with local communities? Come again. 
how can businesses and the private sector um, engage with local communities in efforts like this? Uh, I think uh, one of the answers I would like to say is looking at la the landscape approach. I've already mentioned that, which should be able to create a space that is bringing uh, different actors, the, the, the private sector, public, civil society, because there are different aspects, regulatory and that kind of thing. And within that area, deliberately create space for communities and other important stakeholders uh, to participate. So that is one, one, one way uh, I think that we need to go. And it's, I think, the principal way. The other point I can probably put across is um, the issue of the need to diversify products uh, that come from the forests. Uh, following up on the issue that we are encouraging people to plant a tree, even if it's in the backyard, I might not be able to sell it, but probably if there are diversified products like, for example, carbon, I might be able to participate in that particular aspect, not necessarily in the timber aspect. And then um, the, third th the third issue I would say is that businesses, private sector uh, forestry businesses, really need to work to create, deliberately work to create space for smallholders to participate uh, in their value chains. Uh, because forestry by nature is a, a long-term uh, business, and if people are assured that they have a relationship which is based on mutual trust, mutual respect, uh, 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 and, 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 and the returns are known, uh, that that would, be, would serve as an encouragement for more people to actually uh, join into, into planting trees. Yeah, and I, it seems like a crucial component is hiring people in a position like yours to be a liaison with the community. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably yeah, thank you, Vanessa. Actually, uh, uh, our, our entire CSR department in Uganda is entirely local. We are all Ugandans, but more importantly, all our CDOs and community liaison officers are people also who come from the respective communities where we have operations. So that, that, that I thought is an obvious point, but thank you. <laughs> I think it's very important and may not be obvious to, to, to everyone. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we'll have one more question uh, to anyone on the panel. How can a rural community or rural-based organization engage in sustainable forest projects? Can I perhaps start with that? Sure. Sure. Uh, one of the things we've seen, and, and, and following a bit up on what Alex was saying about this diversifying of the product, so diversifying sort of the basket of products that you have to offer to make sure that what you have on your land is economically viable in the long term. The other one, of course, is to band together in cooperatives, in forest and farmer producer organizations, so that you have lots of people involved with each with a small piece of land, but together they can repair and send products out in bulk. And we've seen that as a very positive way of increasing the value of the land and the products that are being sold, but also as a very good way of making sure that you have an organization that can help with the capacity building that's there by making the links to those that would buy the, the products and add the value to it at the local level. So having these forest and farmer producer organizations is, is a very good way of doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Meta. Uh, it's time to wrap up. So I'd like to ask each of our panelists to um, provide a short closing statement, a key takeaway you'd like to leave with, with the audience today. We'll start with Kathy. Um, thank you. I'd like to point people's attention to the Trillion Trees Initiative, which is to address climate change and, um, and forest loss. And to uh, plant trees, it's at 1t.org, O-R-G. And um, it's a platform of the World Economic Forum designed to support the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, led by UNEP and FAO. And certainly that is a, a platform where funders can also be found to help um, plant trees uh, across Across the world, frankly, and so perhaps some local communities can be connected through this platform. Thank you for that. And if you look in the chat, we've shared the link to the Trillion Trees Initiative. Uh, Meta, do you have a closing statement for us? Oh, you're on mute, Meta. We've heard so much today about the benefits of forests, both for the biodiversity but also for the people. And I think that's one of the key messages we want to take 
back with us, particularly at the moment when Huma was saying that we need to take the opportunity of this pandemic to build back better. And we've heard so much about nature-based solutions and forests really are the ultimate nature-based solutions in that they do provide the jobs and the livelihoods. They do provide the habitats for biodiversity and they can help mitigate climate change and adapt to it. But at the same time, they can help us with this building back better because we do need to have a look at the economic recession that's coming in the wake of the pandemic. And that's where forests can really help. We've seen all of these pictures of people that are leaving the cities because they've lost their jobs. They've come out to the rural areas, to the countryside, and their social network, their social uh, protection, if you will, are the forests in many cases. So we need to make sure that we protect the forests, that we use them and conserve them in a sustainable manner, and we make them part of the solution. So it's a matter for us, all of us know how important they are, but it's a matter that we do speak to those that are preparing those stimulus packages for addressing that economic recession so that we do take them into account and that we use forest as the stepping stone for building back better. Thank you. Thank you. Huma, closing statement. Yeah, so I'll build on uh, Meta's remarks. I think building back uh, better is going to be very important. I think we need to, this is a, a time for us to reassess um, business and, and move away from business as usual. And I will again reiterate that we need integrated solutions. Um, there is no silver bullet to safeguarding the world's forests. Uh, we need a multi-pronged approach that takes many of these different solutions into account. We need responses that take local context into account and develop locally led solutions that work for everyone. Thank you, Huma. Alex. I, I think for me, what I would simply like to reemphasize again is the landscape uh, approach uh, in a way that creates space uh, for communities to be helped, to be facilitated, uh, to address poverty, to address marginalization, to build agency, change the dependency mindset, empower them, because they have at least one important resource that we need in, in, in this whole issue of uh, reef prestation, which is that they have land. They need to be given the technical knowledge and skills to enable them make a contribution in a way that enhances their livelihoods, that doesn't threaten their livelihoods. It should not be a choice of I plant a tree or I do something else. There are ways in which limited land can be utilized effectively, including the growing of trees. And it's the responsibility of people like us on this panel and, and, and in this webinar to make that information available uh, to smallholder, uh, to households, rural households. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And finally, James, we began with your film. Do you have a closing, any closing thoughts to leave us with? Yeah, it's, I think it's been amazing to hear uh, so many different points of view from around the world today, um, all at the same time. And, uh, and that's obviously, you know, partly an outcome of, of, of the COVID-19 crisis that we've all been able to to use technology in this way and, and, and to come together. And I think we need to do much more of that um, and to, to find ways of, of bringing in voices that aren't normally heard in this conversation. Um, and I think we've done quite a good job of that today. I think COVID has to be a wake up call for, for everyone. Um, and, you know, we, we, it's, an, it's an incredible opportunity um, to, to really demonstrate the, the limits of of um, the limits that are placed on us um, here on earth. So yeah, I think um, just like to thank everyone for, for joining today and, and, and for giving us a chance to, um, to play a film, so thank you. Thank you, James. And a big thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, and thank you to FAO for hosting this, this wonderful presentation and this wonderful webinar. Really, I feel like this has been just the start of this important conversation. And I hope that it continues both in all of your, net, um, your networks. And again, for more information on the sustainable forestry and the state of the world's forest report, we've shared the link in the chat. Uh, thank you everyone again for joining us and we'll look forward to continuing the conversation offline. <laughs>